Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today we are joined by reality TV personality, model, actor, and podcast host Jax Taylor. Many of you know Jax from his role on Bravo's Vanderpump Rules, where he earned a reoccurring role after working as part of Lisa Vanderpump's restaurant staff back in 2013. After eight seasons on the show, Jax and his now wife, Brittany, decided to leave the show and focus on their personal lives. Are they coming back? We'll talk about it. Prior to the life on reality TV, Jax spent many years traveling the world as a paid model and occasionally landing acting gigs on shows such as Desperate Housewives and Dexter. More recently, Jax joined a cast full of reality TV personalities on the new reality competition show House of Villains, which aired this past fall on E! The biggest news with Jax, however, is all about his dramatic return to Vanderpump Rules for season 11 here in 2024. Today, we're going to talk about Jax's perspective on life and Vanderpump, how the world works, how his life has changed for the better, maybe worse since leaving the show and on the show, and where he sees his career going from here. Jax, thank you so much for being on Trading Secrets. It's a hell of an introduction. Thank you so much. You know, uh, glad to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. And for everyone listening back home, if you want to check us out on YouTube, check us out on YouTube, because if you do, you would know it. To my left, I have his talent manager, Ryan Revel. And I mean, we could do a whole episode just with you, Ryan. But Ryan, thanks for being here. No problem. Thanks for having us. So anything Jax screws up or gets wrong, you're here to correct it i think a lot of everything that i've gone through in life he can kind of help talk about too because a lot pertains you know to my management too absolutely and ryan uh right i'll say this from uh what you've done in the space it truly is an inspiration so congrats on all your success too and then we'll do you know what let's also do a shout out to Lori krebs she helps us book this too That's so right. Thank we'll you, give Lori. Lori a little how do you do all right here's why i want to start this well i, I saw i was doing some research on you jacks my name jason michael tardick your actual name Jason Michael Couchy is my understanding, and you changed it to Jax Taylor. So I got to say, as a Jason Michael guy, I got to ask, why <laughs> did you change it? Was it a branding strategy? For Tell exactly me about the this business reason. perspective. Jason Michael, <laughs> how common is that? You know, it's a super common name. No, so um, I changed my name in 1999, not legally, was never legally changed. Uh, Taylor is my mother's maiden name, uh, and Jax was just, I just took the S out of J Jason and put an X in there. It was just I, the girlfriend at the time kind of said, why don't you use that? I was modeling at the time. I was yeah. with an agency in Miami. Um, and they're like, you know, your name's just too common and nobody can pronounce your last name. They're like, great last name, but nobody can pronounce it. What's your mother's main name? They had an idea at the agency. They're like, okay, this is what we do. We kind of just mix things around just to make it easier for the clients to say your name and it's easy to remember. Okay. So that's why I did that. Do you think so? Like, obviously we see in the Hollywood stars, like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, we see all these fake names for Johnny branding. Depp, yeah. Johnny Depp. Do you think the whole Jax Taylor branding business thing paid off? If you had to go back, would you have done it again? Yeah, I would. I would. I think it's just easy. It rolls off the tongue a little easier. It's like, it's not nothing against, you know, Jason Michael Couchy. It's a great name. It's like my God given name, you know, for my parents. Um, I just think for what I do for the entertainment uh, industry and, uh, yeah, for the entertainment industry, it just worked out for me. I love it. Now, we're going to get into some of your career track where you are today, but I want to take a step back. I, I saw a interview you did, and you said that your dad had said to you, I feel like you cheated the system because you're making more money than all the engineers at Michigan State. And he almost <laughs> didn't believe you, and you mentioned you had to even show him uh, the pay stub. So, yeah. Um, uh, so this is basically when I started on the show. So we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Yeah. But um, my dad is an old school, old school guy, very conservative, you know, work real hard, you know, pay your bills, take care of your family, you know, just do things the right way, make right choices. Don't, don't, you know, skip corners and all that stuff. Uh, and I didn't listen to any of that. Obviously <laughs> I was just like, I don't, I saw how hard my dad worked. I saw how hard all my family members worked and they all do very well, but they just work so hard. You know, I'm like, well, if I can work half as hard and make more money, can I figure out a way, I need to figure out a way to do that. And that's kind of why I, I decided to leave college and, and go f figure it out for myself, the entertainment world. And people, I think, that are born and raised Midwest and Michigan, yeah. entertainment world's not around you 24-7. No, it's not. It's not, and it's, not, it's not even like it's not fr frowned upon. It's just Midwest people, you know, we go to school, we get jobs, we start families. That's just what we do. And, um, you know, I'm from Michigan. You either go to college or you work for the big three. So that was, it was one or the other. So like Hollywood is to movies, Michigan is to the automotive industry. So everybody in my family worked for General Motors, 
Ford, what, one of them. So you can either get grandfathered into that. That's the only way you can get into those companies. If your father or your grandfather worked there, worked okay. on the line. And a lot of guys did that. They would leave call, or leave high school, go right and work because it was a great living. You made a lot of money. You had a good pension. You had good benefits. And you could start a family right away. And that's what people in Michigan do. They start families right away. Yeah. Um, or you can go to college. That's a lot of people do. And then most people head over to Chicago and get a job in finance or something like that. So that was kind of the options. And I didn't like either of those options. Yeah. I wasn't a fan. I tried it. I definitely tried it. I went to college. But I just would stare off in the, you know, in the sky as the teacher was talking. And I'm just like, what am I doing here? Like, I'm wasting my parents' money. I'm just sitting here. I'm miserable. You know, I'm listening to some guy talk. I'm, I'm at a community college. I'm just miserable. I'm yeah. just miserable. My friends are all away at school. It's, the, you know, I just was just, I was just unhappy. Yeah. And I'm like, even if I finish school, what am I going to, then what am I going to do? Like, then I'm what? still going to be miserable. Exactly. So, you know, I just, I'm one of the unusual people in my family. Everybody else went to the University of Michigan, went to Michigan State, all got, you know, big degrees and got started families. It just wasn't in my cards. And I, I just told my dad, listen, I'm sorry. I know you want this for me. I know you want me to go and do A, B, and C, but I just can't. I just can't. I, I got to leave. Yeah. Well, fast forwarding, this was then, right? We fast right. forward to 2024 and we know we could see headlines. One of the most popular reality stars of all time. One of the most highly compensated from Bravo, et cetera. That is in 2024. We could say that. But you took a shot when everyone said, what the hell are you doing? So before you caught your big break on Vanderpump in 2013, before that, did you have any big, big wins financially from a career perspective where your family was like, oh shit, Jax is doing it right? Or did it take until Vanderpump for the family to say, wait, what's going on? Yeah, uh, it, it definitely took until Vanderpump. Now, before that, I was doing modeling, you know, yeah. it, it, it was, I was making money. I wasn't definitely not becoming rich from it, but I was just getting by. But yeah, Vanderpump was, yeah. So that for, was my, tell me about that. So a lot of people that listen to this show, we hear modeling. We right. don't know what the fuck this industry is. Like, what does that mean? How to do be you honest? I don't like, even know what it is anymore. I've been out of the game since I was 30. I'm now 44. So yeah, uh, the game was a lot different. I was in modeling before social media, before internet, really before any of that, where you had a portfolio and you would go to auditions and you show people your book and you'd have to go in the cold weather, whether I was in Milan in the freezing cold or I was in New York or whatever, you go to these auditions, you show them your book and you get your picture taken and you, whatever. It's a different world now. Yeah. Now there's so you know, social media and there's the internet and all that. I don't know how the industry works anymore. Okay. Um, but, uh, that's how I started. So if you want to go back, um, I got into the modeling. This is kind of when I was having a hard time with school in Michigan. I just wasn't sure where I fit in. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I got approached by a woman. She approached me and my, my mother actually. And she said, Hey, would your son be interested in taking some pictures? I was working at a, uh, a fruit market at the time, you know, yeah. I was making, I don't know. This is, I would say maybe $300 a week, something like that. And I, you know, this woman approached me, Hey Jax, would you be interested in some pictures? I think you look good for this. And I really, I was like, no, I'm not doing that. This is not for me. No, no, no. <laughs> anyway. So my mom was like, don't worry, I'll work on them. I didn't know that. She talked to the woman on the side. She worked on me after a while. And then the woman again approached me, Hey, listen, we want to offer you X amount of dollars. And at the time it was for Kmart and it was like five or $600. And I was like, that's a lot of money. Cause I was only making 300 a week sure. and you're going to give me $500 for three hours of my time to do the, the weekly Kmart ads that come out in the newspaper. So I was like, Okay, let me try that. So I tried it, you know, and then I was getting booked again, again, and then other companies, Kohl's and all these other companies. I'm like, this is great. Yeah. So I, I did as much as I could do in Michigan, kind of just, you know, bled that state dry. And I decided to go on to the next state, which was Chicago. So basically modeling was kind of like, I was explaining this earlier. It's kind of like uh, baseball. You got to go through the, the A, double A, triple A before you get to the pros. Got it. So these states, Chicago is kind of like double A ball. Then you go to Miami, that's you know, double A. Then you go to New York, which is, New York is like the pros. But you got to hit all these other places first before you go to New York to build your book. Okay. Now, today's a little different, you know, because of social media and because things are just a lot quicker now. But in those days, you had to go see, you had to go do ads in different countries and different places to build a good portfolio before you went to the, the Mecca, which was New York City. So you get to New York City, you hit the Mecca. Let me ask you this. Your worst year from a financial standpoint, modeling your best year. What do those numbers look like? Uh, man, the worst year, um, I mean, I wasn't really making a lot. And in those days too, there's no union in modeling at all. So, and they take, you know, depending where you go, they can take up to 40% of your money. The agencies. The agencies. And they, they have, they have 
they can pay you whenever they want. It's not like you get paid every Friday. They can take up to 90 days, 120 days to pay you. So was I making a lot of money? Absolutely. But I was never getting paid. So I was always behind. So yeah, I would do a job, for instance, maybe a job for a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand dollars or whatever. But they would take up to six months to a year to pay me. So I was always behind on my bills because I was waiting for checks all the time. So I was never really ahead of the game. Yeah, I remember. I have like I think about where I am now. I had that one moment where I was in a financial situation for the first time ever. I was able to like put my card down and pay for the tab. When you think about this time in your life, based on where you are today. Do you have any memories of either like, holy shit, if I pay for this, I'm going to have no money left in I my account? I would say every day up until I got on Vanderpump Rules. You were paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I wasn't, I was, <laughs> I was overdraft king, man. I was, <laughs> I was just like, I just prayed in my mailbox that I didn't overdraft. And sure enough, I, I mean, the amount of times I overdrafted and knew I was at a bar or a restaurant knowing I was going to overdraft, but you felt stupid if you didn't put your card down, you know, and I was going out places and knowing that I couldn't afford it, but I didn't have a choice. If I needed to be in this crowd, I had to be out. I had to do this. Okay. And at those times were, there were different times, you know, so, um, you had to do what you had to do to be around certain places. And, and yeah, if, if I didn't have the money, I had to figure out how to get it and I'll just figure it out later, you know, and later was the overdraft notices, which you'd have to pay double if you remember how those worked. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was struggle. It was ma mainly a struggle. And you know, LA is a type where you just, you have to hustle here. You have to have your hands in 10 different pots. You still do. Yeah. Um, just to make it here because you know, it's so expensive, you know, and you can't have a normal job here if you're in the entertainment industry because normal jobs are nine to five. Well, my auditions were nine to five. So what am I going to do? I can't work a retail store. I can't work a real job. I have to get a bartending job. So hence is why I started going to Vanderpump. No, that's why I, well, first I started off actually with Ryan's wife. Okay. She has a, um, a company called 200 proof, which she would have, you know, guys and girls, uh, going to different events, parties, Paramount, Sony, whatever. She would hire, uh, she would staff parties. It was a staffing agency. Okay. So I would work that because it worked out where I can work the nights and that way to save my days for auditions. Okay. What so, year was that? That's when, it, when Moni started her company. I was her okay. second employee, 2004, because I was her second employee. She's a huge company now. Okay. Yeah. She has hundreds of people now. She's been around forever. Yeah. But I was there when she started the company, me and my other buddy, Alan Joban, who's now a UFC commentator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we were her first two employees. Okay. So, I, I asked. And this. Tom Sandoval and Tom Schwartz too. They were all, we all worked with Moni. Oh, holy shit. I had yeah. no idea. That's a full circle moment there. Mm -hmm. That's how you met in 2004. Yes. No, I didn't. Oh, sorry. I knew Moni, but it was my girlfriend at the time. Yeah. We started in 2010. That's okay. when I met Jax and the whole crew. And they had all been working then for your now wife. Well, well what happened? Was, yes, we were all working for Moni. And then Ryan, obviously his manager, Moni was like, listen, I know you guys are all about to get on this show. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Sure. Uh, you're going to need some management. So she's like, hey, why don't you meet my, was it boyfriend at the time? Yeah, boyfriend. Uh, so we all met, I think Ryan, I think we all met you at Belmont, I want to say. No, I met. Was it? I met all, all you guys. Not you. You weren't there. Coachella in 2010. Oh, yeah, Coachella. Sorry. Okay. That's right. Okay. It was all different times. Yeah. But anyway, his wife, because we were working for her, brought, introduced us to Ryan and that's how it all went. Got down. it. I want to ask you this. Modeling, give, give, give me a high level. Do you think in this time frame before Vanderpump, you ever made over 100K? Like, oh, I'm just trying uh, to get an idea. Total? And maybe in my whole in modeling annual. career. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think totally. I've done it. I did it for, I want to say strong for 10 years. And then when I did it, you got to remember, you know, you didn't have to make that much money to live like, now, now nah, it's different, yeah, you know? Yeah, so $10,000 lasted me a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a different time, you know? Yeah. Um, I think overall, if, if I had to guess how long, how much I've made, overall, maybe not that much. I would say maybe between, in the 10 years, maybe between two and 300,000. Not okay. much at all. Enough to live, enough to survive, enough to travel, enough to live a great life. Okay. Um, but again, because I was always behind, and that they, there was no structured payment in modeling. There was no union. Mm -hmm. um, I was always behind. So I always had to have other income coming in to pay for my bills until I got my other checks. So, um, but I, I don't regret it at all. I was with the best agency in the world, the yeah. number one modeling agency in the world. So I was with Ford and you can't get any better than that. And in the modeling industry for guys, it, I mean, there's maybe five to 10 guys in the world that are making millions of dollars, maybe five to 10. There was the Marcus Schenkenberg at the time. Yeah. There was the Tyson, uh, what's his name? Tyson, Tyson Beckford. Yep. There was uh, like, those were the top two. Like when I was, 
that was it. Male modeling wasn't there what wasn't, it is today. It wasn't a full industry like yeah. the females were. Females yeah. was a Hold every girl was making a ton. Guys were always just the backdrop. We're always the guy holding the hand or whatever in those days. Um, so there was not like every model that I know, even the big ones always had other jobs. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't solely do it unless you were the Marcus Schenkenberger, the Tyson Beckfords, really. Okay. Here's the interesting thing. When I think about career navigation, we've had people come on this podcast that are billionaires. We've had people sharks from shark tank. We've had all different people. They all have a story similar to yours where they did something that most people in their life told them not to do. Yeah. What I'm going to tell you is, that's much different is they did that for about a year, a two years. Maybe Ryan Serhan from Million Dollar Listing did it for three and went broke. You were doing this for 10 years yeah. plus before you made it. Yeah. And you got dad knocking on your door saying, what are you doing? Did you ever at any point say to yourself, enough's enough. Yeah. I probably need to go back to Michigan and start working for the car factory. It's, it's a funny story. So I'll get into that. So um, I kind of went through right before Vanderpump. I want to say... Uh, two or three months before Vanderpump started, I said enough's enough. I, I packed up my truck. I called my dad. My dad actually called me. He's like, well, are you done jerking off? Are you done? <laughs> like, when are you going to come home? Yeah. Like, when are you going to get a job? Like, I, you know, I, that's the time where I was bartending. I wasn't, I was shifting again. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I didn't really want to model anymore. I was done. Um, I was bartending at Sir. That's how I started Sir because I was dating Stassi at the time, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So in the meantime, until I figured it out, I got a job at Sir. I was dating Stassi. She's like, why don't you pick up some shifts here until you figure out what you want to do? So I started doing that. Um, and then my dad was just like, you know, why don't you come, why don't you come home? Um, yeah, I go, dad, listen, I got no money to my name. He's like, listen, I'll, I'll give you a thousand bucks, pack up your truck, get your ass home. I said, okay, that's, I'll do that. So I'm going to probably skip some things here, but I, I did that. I did what he said. As soon as I packed up the car, like as soon as I packed up my truck and all this stuff, I get a phone call from Lisa Vanderpump. Literally my, my truck's packed, mind you, my, my GMC pickup truck with, I think I had $500 in my bank account at the time, something like and that. And you're heading home back to Michigan. And I'm heading back to you're Florida. You're done modeling Florida. Florida. So you're done I'm modeling. Done. I'm Entertainment's gonna, done. Yeah, I'm going to I'm like, you know what? I really want to be a firefighter. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go to Florida. I had some family and friends that were in the firefighting that were kind of got we're going to get me in. I'm a very hands-on guy. I'm not a pencil pusher. I'm not a suit and tie kind of guy. I like to work. So I thought this would be a good job. I can do the school. I'm athletic. I can, you know. So anyway, that was my plan. Lisa Vanderpump gives me a call. We had this idea for a show. All you and your friends there at work at Sir, there's something there. There's a dynamic there. There's a lot of chaos there. There's a soap opera there. I have this idea of filming you guys and your dramatics. I'm not quite sure, but we want to put you on film and see where it goes. Now, I've been promised everything under the sun up to this point. I was, you know, commercials. Yeah, you got this. You got this. Let down, let down. It's just constant let down. That's basically... 90% of everything, you, I would say more than that, 95% of everything you do out here is a letdown. Mm. You know, you get very few things. So it's constant rejection out here. Just rejection after rejection after rejection. And I had enough. I just, I really had enough of rejection. And so again, when I heard this, I was like, God, I've heard this too. I'm like, oh, here's, here we go. The truck's all packed up. Someone's offering me a job. I'm like, here we go. I'm like, okay, I'll see it through. I'm going to see it through. Even though I promised my dad I would be on the road by Thursday, this pilot shot was for Friday. I'm like, oh my fuck, I'm going to have to lie to my dad. I'm like, okay, I'll make it work. What day did Lisa call you? Just it, was like a, it was like a Monday. Wow. It was a Monday and I was planning on leaving on a Thursday. The pilot we were shooting, I had to go to Burbank for this in the studio that came, we want to put you on film was Friday and I was like fuck I promised my dad already and this and that I'm like okay I'll figure it out I'll get around it I go what what's one more I'm not gonna get it anyway whatever let's just do one more thank god I did but, yeah uh and uh well the rest is really history after the, that so the rest is history but you so you got your bags packed you're ready to trucks go packed home. trucks packed I yeah. mean the timing there it's, I can have a whole podcast on timing like coincidence fate I don't I mean when you if think, I would have left a, a week earlier a week or a earlier month sooner or or I mean, there's so many things that could have happened, but I like to think somebody upstairs yeah. saw the, the, the freaking hell I've been through for 10 years of grinding and grinding and grinding and, you know, two steps forward, 10 steps back. I like to see, say that someone saw something up there and said, you know what, we're going to give Jax his break here. Someone upstairs said something. I just feel like it because the timing and how that worked out was... I mean, it's almost, it's just crazy. It's it, crazy. It's hard to imagine. It's hard that, to imagine. Right? So you're talking about 500 plus weeks in the industry. You're talking about 3,500 plus days in the industry. Your borderline broke. Dad says come home. And that, and literally within three days, yeah. all this comes together. You shoot the pilot though. Yeah. From a business perspective, you're still like, 
when you shoot a pilot, you don't know what's going to happen. So are you still floating? And uh, did, so, did you almost go back again before you actually got the deal? Because that's a long turnaround. It time. is long turnaround. But I and I totally so listen. I'm I have my bags packed. I'm ready to go. And she's like, No, you can't. I promise you. This. What can I do to make you stay? Or what can I do? Or I'll give you. You know, you can make more money here. What can I do? I just. She was just very. She knew that the show was going to hit in her mind. Excuse me. Um, I didn't know anything about that. I was just kind of like, she's just milking me. She's just, I'm staying here extra long. I'm going to piss off my dad. I made a promise to my dad. I'm not on the road yet. I'm still here. I'm still lying to him and telling him, dad, I couldn't go because of this and whatever reasons I was lying to my dad. Like, I can't leave yet. I have to, I have some loose ends. I have to tie up still. Uh, meanwhile, I was just trying to prolong the, finding out when this pilot got picked up. So then the pilot gets picked up. And then I was like, oh my God, okay, this is this is gonna happen. Mind you, I'm in severe debt at this point. Like severe. How much we talk? I mean, I was bleeding with my credit cards, were bleeding. Um, I was living paycheck to paycheck. My Stasi and I's relationship was just ending. So I like I it was just it mean mind me, my truck's packed, I got nowhere to live, I'm couch surfing, money is my credit cards are bleeding. I'm told that I'm gonna get this show by Lisa. She's swearing that this is gonna happen, but it's not for sure. I'm like, what the fuck do I do? I don't know what to do. Yeah. I don't know what to do here. And I'm just like, I just got to go with my gut. I'm just going to wing it out and just couch surf for a couple more weeks. And, uh, yeah, the, so the show gets picked up. Like I said, my, I'm broke as hell all in the first year. I would say the first season, all my money went just to pay off my debt. I had a lot of it. How long did it take you to get on your feet and to make more in 10 years of modeling? just within social media and everything after the show premieres? Like a few years, a couple years, is it immediate? I remember there was no social media. There was no social media. That's a good point. There was no brand deals. So you make money, and, I, and we're, we're, we're gonna be very careful with what we talk about money on Vanderpump, just so you know, and everybody from Bravo is listening. But the only way to monetize then is, of course, the show. Right. And then what, appearances? Yeah, well, they were those were very few and far between too. Because now, again, appearances were a new thing too, as well. It's obviously a big thing now. But when the show started, we're like, how can we monetize this? How can we make more money? Because the first season of Vanderpump, I'm going to tell you right now, we didn't make a ton of money. Yeah, we didn't. You know, and like I said, every check that I made went to my credit cards, yeah. went to pay off shit. I was just trying to pay off, pay off, because I had creditors calling me, blowing up my phone every day. You know, I don't know if you know what it's oh, like yeah. For, yeah. when you're down and everybody's calling you for their money, right? So I just wanted to get them off my back. So we had other ways we had to make money. So appearances, we would go to Vegas and then we would, you know, they would fly us all in uh, and give us like a thousand dollars. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're right. He's right. Uh, we had to get ourselves there. They would, you know, and then give us a thousand dollars like per yeah. cast member, which is nothing now. Yeah. But at the time, a thousand bucks were like, great. So I had to like do that. We would have to do appearances and then whatever social, like social media was just starting to come. It was just starting, but it wasn't on, it wasn't on analytics. It was on your followers. So it, no matter if they just saw you had a ton of followers, it'd be like, okay, here's Keep X paying. amount of dollars. Here you go. Now it's a little different, but yeah. Ryan, maybe you could speak to this too. At that time, like once social media was adopted, we talk a lot on this show about what people make on social media. It doesn't have to be Jack specifically, but were rates higher, lower? Like what were people paid back when social media just started for like a post when they're on a relevant show? It just depended on your following. Okay. They didn't look deep into the analytics. They basically said, you have 150,000 followers. Here's the rate. Okay. Got it. And there was no, you know, there was no proof of concept, but was it big money or was it like, nah, we're just entering. Here's a thousand bucks. Put a picture up. Okay, so it was much smaller than it because was because it was today. a new it was a new thing too. They yeah, were, everybody was going towards the social media right route now to to market. They were not doing the other other things now. They were putting all their money into social media, but they couldn't figure out until what the last I would probably say f four years it was the analytics, the formula part of it. They need the their ROI. Yeah, right. Of At that point, they was just throwing money out and see who would stick and. A lot of these brands went out of business because they were overpaying. Just overpaying yeah. early on. But they didn't know. They okay. just were thought, okay, this guy's got X amount of followers. He's probably seeing this much traffic. They would just dump that much money. They didn't know. Yeah. Know? Okay. My heart wants to go right into Vanderpump. My head wants to think about our listeners back home. You were in a shit ton of credit card debt. I yeah. can't pass this. Do you have a trading secret for anyone back home that's listening to this 
they might be in credit card debt. They're stuck. Any advice of maybe how to get out of it or thoughts on just the overall idea of credit card debt? I, I Now, if, if you can't pay your credit card off every month, then I don't use your credit card. I, you know, I try to pay cash for everything. Okay. You know, um, I'm, I'm fortunate now where I can pay my credit card off now, so it benefits me because I like my points and my things like that. So I use my credit card now for everything. I don't even ever use cash yeah. because I do pay it off every month. So I'm winning. I'm beating the credit card system, yeah. but I'm getting my points. I'm sorry. I'm getting my miles. I'm getting all that stuff. But I suggest if you're starting out, stay away from credit cards. If you can't pay cash for things, again, I'm old school. My dad paid cash for everything. My grandfather paid cash for everything. We were old school mentality. But if I don't know the young generation now, I don't know. If, I think getting in debt is just a, a normal thing. Yeah. I, I mean, everybody's in debt. Let's keep it. Here. I mean, you see it all. I mean, we're going to talk a little about social media and your business behind that, but we see it on social media, like keeping up with the Joneses, everyone's spending yeah, all this money. You, you have to, and like if you want to put yourself in certain circles, you're going to have to spend. Right. And then you'll figure it out later. That's the mentality out here is like, I need to get to that party. The only way I'm going to get to that party is if I have a thousand dollar suit on this, I got to drive this car, whatever. I'll make it happen. We'll figure it out later. That's their mentality out here. But then by the time you figure it out later, you're so behind. And then the interest rates are so damn high, you just you're swimming. You're okay, let me bring it back drowning. to you though. Sorry. That's the mentality. Spend, and you'll be in the right places right. here. You did that when you ended up with Stasi and working at Sir. Do you think it was that approach? Was it you had to spend to finally meet Stasi to then get the Sir, or was it not that case at all? No, no. In those days, it didn't. It had, it, it that didn't matter because I was already dating her, and I was at the time. So before then, I would just you no know, because I was doing the modeling thing. So. I got invited to certain parties and the ones I didn't get in and I was sneaking. Yeah. yeah I, that's I what, that's in. what my point was. I would steal people's drinks cause I couldn't afford drinks. Yeah. So I'd wait till whatever, go to a table and just lift a drink or whatever like that. And that's, that's what I would do. I do whatever I can to fit into these parties. If I had to sneak in, if I had to pretend I was an employee, if I had to, you know, grab a drink off a table that wasn't mine, whatever you had to do. That's you, why just, I asked. Cause I think that when we spend and people at home, they think they have to spend for a certain reason. You had mentioned, you thought you had to spend to get in certain places, but really it was like the grit and grind that got you into those places that ended up making you are what you are now. And I think for people back home, if you think you have to spend and you're in a tough position to do it, don't do it. Let's go back to Vanderpump. You start in 2013, eight seasons, 165 episodes, what year was it for you and your life that you're like, holy shit, financially, I did it. I, I did it. Um, for me, I think it was like season three. Okay. Well, three, it started season two. Yeah, end of season two and three, beginning of three. Okay. From then on, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. All right. But within that time frame, season three on and even early on, yeah. you had massive setbacks. You had lefts. You had rights. You had all these things happening in your personal world. How did those things impact actual monetization of things and in your business world? Well, I didn't really, I didn't really get into the business world until after I left the show, to be honest. Interesting. Uh, the beginning, I was just kind of riding the train, riding the wave, riding whatever it is. I wasn't, you know, because we were so busy with the show. And those days, too, when those beginning days, we were shooting 20-something episodes. So we were constantly filming. And when we weren't filming, we needed the downtime for just to, my mental health. You know, yeah. because there was just so much going on. The show was so popular so fast. We were the very, we were very new. That kind of reality show was the very first one of that time. Now there's tons of shows of on course. Bravo. But at that time, we were a very new show. We were, there was nothing like ours. So we were very popular very fast. So yeah, the money was coming in. And because we were getting more episodes, they were paying us more. But uh, it was, it was grueling. It was, you know, yeah. there was a lot of stuff going. You got to remember too, I was like a kid in a candy store. You got to remember, I was grinding my whole time in California. And then all of a sudden, here's the lottery ticket. Now, make sure you keep your head on straight. But I've been keeping my head on straight for so long and grinding and trying to figure out things that I finally could be like, I can kick back a little bit. I can spend a little bit more here I can spend a little bit more here. And, and, you know, I definitely got myself into some trouble here and there. But, you know, it's just it's, it's normal. I mean, time. It, I was a I was a lot younger, a lot naive. I didn't really care. I didn't really think about uh the repercussions of certain things. What's you know, the most touchable a little bit, you can say? Yeah. What do you think like the most outrageous thing that you purchased was in this time of like I went from nothing to something, I got all this money, I'm gonna live. I like... had six sports cars. <laughs> Holy shit. Did you go back into <laughs> I, debt? I, I just no, I didn't go back into debt. I was fine. Yeah. yeah just no. killing it. I was just like I was paying cash for all of them. Oh it my was just yeah. I just yeah. I lived in an apartment with two uh two parking spaces. And I had to rent out all the other parking space. Like I was buying other people's parking. For your six stupid. cars. <laughs> just stupid. 
Unbelievable. I love it. I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear all that. Let's go back to some of your, your, your rock bottom Eight. moments though. No, I'm sorry. Two. Not six. I had four in a golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I don't know why I said six. All four, right. Give me, you're doing the math five. now. Sorry. Five in a golf cart. Give me five. the get, numbers. Show a little bit. Got to get some. I'm sorry, five in a golf cart. What yeah. do you think the total value of those cars were? I don't know. Take a shot. Half million. Yeah. Yeah. Killing it. That's probably right. Yeah. From paying off credit card to a half million and paying off spots. Yeah. That is a beautiful turnaround. I want to talk about another. So you, what's interesting, Jax, is you live this life of, uh, it feels like a roller coaster. Like you're in the rock pits of like packing up and going home and then boom, Vanderpump. And then you get this opportunity, you're making all this money, five cars. And then we've seen some of the, 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 the setbacks you've had yeah. where you've hit rock bottom again. Yeah. What's your secret? for digging yourself out of rock bottom. How do you do it? Yeah, I have a strong partner. I have a good wife. Yeah. But how <laughs> about times there were times the you didn't have a wife though. I mean, as as you're talking about after I left during, the show during, even during the show when oh. it aired and stuff like oh, there are so many points in your life you hit rock bottom, yeah. but you bounce back up. Most people don't bounce back up. And I'm wondering what is it about Jax Taylor that not only can you bounce back up, but you use it as like a catapult up. You know, I <sighs> I just don't allow myself. I, I get I get upset. I'll get depressed for a little while, and then I'll say, you know what? Enough, enough. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. You need to bounce back. I can be resilient, and I and that's just what I did. I know I know I can fix these problems. I get into a hole sometimes. I'll yeah. get into a hole mentally, physically, emotionally, and then I'll just realize, listen, you got to get yourself out. You got yourself into this. We'll we'll make this work. We'll fix it. We're, we live in a world where you do something bad, people forget about it in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So that's just what I was ha going through. I'm like, well, if I mess up, yeah, people will forget about it in a week, couple of weeks. I just got to stay quiet. Um, but it was tough because everything I was doing was under a microscope. So I would get nailed for certain things here and there. And I'd be like, damn it, damn it. You know, like mm -hmm. it was tough. It was tough. There was tough times. There was times where I was just like, I'm just over this all. I can't like, I'm so tired of like people just watching every little move that I do and every little move that I make. And people are sitting outside my apartment waiting, not only paparazzi, but fans would figure out where I live and they would just sit outside and, and it was just getting a lot. It was getting a lot. And it was just, he was driving my mental health crazy. And, you know, there was times where I, I needed help. I had to ask, you know, Ryan, like there's not many people I could trust at that time either. Yeah. You can't trust anybody out here. So there's very few. Yeah. My publicist, my manager, my wife, you know, maybe a handful of my friends, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that's it. Yeah. That's it. And everybody's coming for you at this time, mind you. Like as I'm on top of the world here. I'm on one of the biggest rich shows, if not the biggest show at that time, making tons of money. Everybody wants a piece of you, you know. Four years earlier, nobody wanted to even look at me, except for the credit card companies. Now, credit card companies, hey, we want you back, and here's this, and here's that, and here's, you know, we'll offer you this. And, oh, now everybody wants to be my friend again, you know? So it goes to the highs and then the lows where nobody wants to talk to you again, like where I get in a hole where nobody wants to be around you. So as far as your mental health goes, it's, it's, it's crazy. A lot of ups and a lot of downs. Yeah, I think one thing I'm taking away too is I think about your story. Uh, you, you relied on Ryan and the people you trusted. When you really turn things around with Brittany, it was Brittany. So it feels to me as though the big takeaway there is one, ask for help. And two, the people that come into your life that are a light, like hold on to those people as hard as you can, because those are the people that are going to bring you to the top. Like to me, that's that's a big takeaway. I do want to ask you, though, business perspective. L.A. is everything you've said it is. And of course, it has its upside. But you also see from a business perspective, a lot of people will cling on to you when you're up. Right. A lot of people will drop your ass. Right. When you're down. Were there any like business stories, relationships, things you think about that when you were on your down, some of the business partners or people that you thought were in your corner totally left you. And what's your learning lesson from that? Now, when I left the show, I was, you know, there, there was a lot of confusion on, on how I departed from the show. Whether was I canceled? Was I fired? Did I go on my own? People were really unsure. And, and at that time, it was a very scary time for the whole world. We were going through lots of changes. We had COVID. We had just a gigantic movement. There was, you know, just a lot going on. And, you know, people were diving into, um, I guess I, I was looped into, this is probably the best way to put this. I was kind of in the same circle as a couple other cast members that were canceled. Mm -hmm. And there was no, it was a very foggy situation for a certain people. They were like, was he canceled? Was he not? So I was looped in. So I was shunned. And at that time, I don't even remember, everybody that was getting in trouble, there was people getting fired left and right all over the world. Companies wanted nothing to do with certain people. I mean, you could, if you crossed the street without looking, you got fired. It was just a very, very scary time. Well, I was looped into that. 
And, you know, I went from having it all to losing a lot. I lost a lot of clients. I lost a lot of business deals because nobody wanted to come near me because I was looped into that circle of that cancel culture circle. Now, was I canceled? No, I was not. But I was looped in. Okay. So, you know, just like, to, I don't want to say, uh, well, yeah, that's pretty much what I want to say about that. Okay, that's <laughs> I, fair. I, we'll I leave it at that. I think that's the best way to put it, and it's the best yeah. way to clear it up. Yeah. And like I said, it, it, and I don't blame anybody. It was a scary time. Yeah. We were going, the whole country, the whole world was going through a really, really scary time. Yeah. Uh, not just me. So I'm not trying to be selfish or anything. Everybody was going through it. But uh, it was tough. Yeah. It was tough. Not only did I, you know, I, I lost my job. Um, my wife was pregnant. I had a mortgage. Um, you know, there was just, everything was coming down. I'm like, how am I going to fix this? What am I going to do? Um, at the same time, though, when I did leave the show, I was happy. I was happy for a while. For like yeah. the first two months, I was like, you know what? I'm glad I needed this break. Um, I was very fortunate to be on that show for as long as I was. Yeah. But mentally, I think physically and emotionally, I needed a break. That's um, fair. I think, oh, like towards the end of the last two seasons, the last two seasons I filmed, I was just getting exhausted mentally. Yeah. And I feel like I was just, um, I was always kind of like the, the scapegoat on that show a lot. Like you were the, yeah, I was the, the guy that you they the always guy came that after. Had to step I, I kind of, yeah, I was yeah. the, I, I overshadowed everybody else's flaws. Yeah. So no matter what they all did, it would always come back on me for some reason. Yeah. And I was always the one that they can just go to and be like, Oh, we'll just blame it on Jax or we'll just go after Jax. It just, so it took a toll on me for a while. Yeah. No matter what anybody else did, no matter. And they all did the same exact things that I did, believe it or not. Nobody yeah. realizes that everybody on the show has cheated. Everybody on the show has done something stupid, yeah. but for some reason, we're just going to hone in on what Jax does. Jax, you and make good TV. That's, I, you, you know, know it's a blessing a, and a curse. The world's a better place when I'm on TV. <laughs> exactly. It is. it is. And I'm happy to say that now, and, uh, um, but I definitely needed that break. And I think again, I look upstairs. I think my dad was looking down yeah. on me and saying, you know what? He needs this break. He needs to humble himself a little bit, take a piece of humble pie because I definitely needed it. My ego was getting in the way big time. And, um, I needed just to set back a little bit yeah, and kind of just reflect and regroup, hit rock bottom. I, I strongly think you need to hit rock bottom, uh, before you can make your rise to the top because you need to know what that's like to be at the bottom. So you never get there again. Well, it's the, good, the interesting point is in, tw I think it was 2021. I believe you did an interview with Joe Buck. I listened to one of the quotes you said was, I'm very fortunate to be on the show. Like the show made me, but it took a toll on my mental health. When I see that quote and I hear what you're saying now, and I know it's 2024 and we're going to see you back on those big screens from a business perspective and strategy, like what made you want to come back? Um, I missed it. I, I just, I'm, I, you know, I'm not good at a lot of things. Being on reality TV is one of them. Um, and I enjoy it. Um, I, I'm, I'm just good at it. I'm good at it, you yeah. know? And I, I and I, I really enjoy it, but I just think that I was just, um, and, and like anything else, you just, after doing something for so long, it was almost a decade of my life, you know, I needed a little bit of a break. I just needed a pause. And I think, I wish the pause could have been a little bit different, different yeah. the way it came out, but it, it was what it was. But I think after, you know, stepping back for two years and, and, and just missing it a little bit and realizing, you know what, I want to come back, but I want to do it differently. I want to humble myself a little bit. I want to take a different perspective. I want to look at it this through a different perspective. I want to, I want to come at it in a different way. Now the, the yeah. old guy doesn't exist anymore. The old yeah. Jax is not around. I got a new guy here that I want to put back on TV that I think that people will enjoy that people want to see where I've been for the last couple of years, what I've been up to. I got married. I had a baby, you know, my son's two and a half now there's just a lot going on and I have a, a different group of friends now that we're all in the same same boat and um, I just think there's a, a story to tell there yeah personally things have changed for you dramatically it's amazing yeah. to see I mean what a father and partner you are today it's unbelievable I want to talk about those four years though you've been off the show you had said it yourself business stuff came after the show so obviously your top revenue generator for you was the show when you were Correct. on when you're off, I've heard you talk about some things. Like I've even heard you say things about like you crush it on Cameo and stuff like that. Yeah. How, let, let's just talk. Like, what were other sources of revenue that you were able to get going during this time period? And I mean, I already said Cameo. So, like, how on Cameo did you do? Could you make a couple bucks? Can I talk about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I made. A, I'm. I'm around the four hundred thousand dollar. Just off Cameo, yeah. say that's that's like top up there. Yeah. How, how, how much do you charge per video? hundred bucks. Damn. So you're pumping out a lot of those things. Yeah. All right. So cameo 400 K. That's great. What are other ways that you could generate revenue um, when you're off uh, social media content, okay. you know, gotcha. um, you know, the brands were starting to come back 
you know, they, they saw that, like, you know, that I hit my rock bottom, that I was apologetic and there was that, you know, sincerity there and, you know, that I wanted to change my life around and that the people see me, that I am a good father, that I am a good person, that I just made a mistake. You know, I, I was hanging around the wrong people. People make mistakes, yeah. you know, but everybody likes a, a good comeback story. And, and that's what I wanted. And I just, like I said, I'm a, I'm a different person than I used to be. You know, I'm a lot, I think... I'm just like I took a piece of humble pie after all that. So I just I'm a little appreciative yeah. of, of of things. I'm happy to be where I'm at right now. I think I'm at I'm back to where I want to be. Like I started this project of mine a couple of years ago, and I'm back now where I want to be. I got my accounts back to where they need to be. My life is where it needs to be. I got good great relationships with not only my friends, my family, with other businesses. It took some time to get to this point, but I had to hit the rock bottom, and I I. I think it's it's really important for people to hit that that low point. You know, they can hit low point, but you got to hit the rock bottom. You got to get to the point where you're like, I don't think I can get any lower. And then it's like, and then it's a goal to get to the top again, and mm -hmm. then to stay at the top. Yeah, it's it's a lot easier to get there, but then you got to stay there. Yeah, and that's hard, especially for people like myself and the other cast members on the show. We are looked at under a microscope. Whatever we do, anything we do, if I go to the gas station, and you know, I get caught. You, I just always have to be very, very aware of everything that I'm doing because people just love to bring you down. People at the top, they want to come after you. They want to come That's after That's what they you. do. They want to see you. They want to destroy you. When people ask me about my show and they say, give me the one common denominator, whether it's Gary V, A-Rod, Gronk, Sergio, Athletes, Macklemore, any of these people, the one common denominator, and it's consistent. Every one of them fucked up. Every one of them hit the lowest of lows. Right. But they just found ways to either implement like change everything and either create a business from their low use it as a launch pad yeah. where I think most people in this world hit the low and they can't get out of it. We're all human beings. That's it. We okay. all fuck up. We all fuck up. We all make mistakes. The yep. only difference is, is that we are on television, on radio, whatever. So we're under a microscope. Yep. Everybody, everything that we've done. So is half the, oh, the whole world, the yep. world's everyone's messed up. Nobody in this world's perfect. Right. Again, we are under a microscope. Yep. So, you know, and then you're out, and especially living in Hollywood, and you're you, you got fame, and you know you're trying to be perfect, but there's temptation, you mm -hmm. know, and you slip up. It happens. It happens. As long as you're you, you're aware of it, you, you you apologize for making those mistakes, and you move on, and you learn from it. Now, if you keep repeating these, then well, you deserve it. Then you deserve but, it. You got to learn from it. You're right. someone that did. I want to ask you a little bit about this. You had said there's this famous and Vanderpump famous like scene where you said to Tom. I'm the number one guy in the group, right? I'm sure you remember that, yeah. right? Like we're both the guys, but yeah. I'm the number one guy. Right. When you think about your success, do you think there's anything that connects to that scene, like either with your confidence, determination, or just even having the chops to be like, I'm the guy that's got you to where you are? And do you think people back home need to have that? Yeah. If you're going to come out here, you do. You'll get eaten alive and spit out here. I, it's, it's, it's just like the song blinded by the light. Like you, you really, really gotta have, if you're going to come out here, is that, it's addressing like, if you're yeah. going to come out here and you're going to be in the entertainment world, you better have a bank account. First of all, <laughs> you better have some money in the bank. Um, and you got to have some grit. You got to be able to take a beating. I, I mean, when I say a beating, if you're coming out here to LA and get in the entertainment industry, you got to be prepared to take a serious, serious beating. It, it's just the way it is. And, you know, I've done that. I've taken many, many beatings, and you, but I learn from them. You're going to have to learn from them. I'm, it's, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just the way they, this way industry works. It's a shitty industry, man. It's a tough industry. It's a hard industry. It can be fun. It can be fun, but it, it can be also very, very scary. Do you think you made most of your money during the show? You took the time off to find yourself right. in this industry. Going back to TV. Do you think now the businesses and the social media revenue you're generating will be more than you'll make on TV since all the change you've made? Or do you think TV money will be more than what you've been able to create since uh, being off the show? I think mm -hmm. it depends. Alternative revenues, the gold it to pay for everything. Yeah. You okay. Know? Bank your bank your show money, spend it and Spend your bills and your overhead on the alternative revenue. That's the goal. And I, I've learned oh, okay. my lesson because I never want to get to where I was couch surfing ever again. So now I have a plan A, B, and C, and I don't touch certain accounts. And I'm very, very, very frugal with my money. I don't have any debt other than my mortgage. You know, I make sure everything I pay off. And um, I have a son now, so I'm not just responsible for myself and my wife. I'm responsible for my child. We got private school. We got health insurance. We got all kinds of stuff, and especially living out in California. You know it's not cheap. So it's tough to, you know, 
my, now it's tough for me just to go out and spend because now I'm responsible for so many people. But I, I strongly suggest if you were going to come out here, man, just save your money. Save, save your save. money. It's 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 like they because as soon as you land at that airport, man, they got you. Yeah, they got you. They got. I think in 2024 it's a lot different than when they started. And it's yeah, it's a different. It is so many ways to monetize your celebrity today. So, Right. First then. I mean, you guys were really gritting it out. And I wish I could live somewhere else and do what I do. I wish. Yeah. I, I want to be out of California so bad. But think about it. Like, you couldn't start a podcast 10 years ago. Sure. You couldn't start a merch line. You couldn't really invest in companies because you didn't have access. the capital or the access to do it. Yeah. And you, ha but you have to this day. Like, I have to have a merch line. I have to ha I have a bar. I have to have a book coming out. I have to have a podcast. I have to have a show. Because, like I said, they don't make it easy here in California. They, yeah. they almost try to make it impossible for you to start a business or be successful. It's like California doesn't want you to be happy. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that's it's, it's the whole, yeah, the way it's set up is a very big challenge in California. That's why we've seen a lot of people... Bounce. Like bounce, but you you uh, you did stay here. You did start a business here. I want to give you an opportunity. Yeah. Tell people if they come to visit LA a little bit about your restaurant. Well, I have a bar called Jax's in Studio City, which I was very fortunate enough to get. Um, it's uh, I got great partners. They're uh, th my partners own uh, uh, bars called Rocco's, which are a bunch of them all over the city. So I'm their partner. Um, we have a restaurant that sits next to one of the Rocco's venues in in Studio City, and. Um, yeah, they came to a buddy of mine, uh, my buddy Dave, and they approached him. They're like, hey, would Jax be – we have this space. We have an open space here. We want to do something here. We own the land, which is awesome, by the way. Yep. I have a partners that own the land. Sick. I don't have to pay rent, which is really nice. Huge. Uh, they said, we have this space. We, we don't know what to do with it. We love Jax. W would he be interested in maybe opening a bar with us? And, you know, he they came to me. Uh, Dave came to me with us, and I'm like, this is a dream. Like this is like what guy doesn't want to own a sports bar? Yeah, you know, like so. Uh, we had a couple meetings, and um, you know, you know, uh, threw some numbers together, and it just made sense. It was almost just almost too easy. I was like, I was almost looking like, where's the camera? This is a joke because this is like you're coming to me, offering me this, and I don't have to put any of my own money in, and it was just. It's the power of your brand, man. The power you, of the brand. You and created it, it just, that, and it saw, and it made me feel good. Like, okay, I'm doing the right thing because I thought in other aspects of my life. If I keep doing the right thing, things will come. Things, things will, will come. come. You know, I was doing good, just being a good father, just doing the, making good choices. Like I have it on my arm. I know. My dad I saw used that to say tattoo, this right? all the time to me, no matter what I did, make good choices. My grandfather used to say it. He used to, my dad used to sign Christmas cards, make good choices to me and my sister. So it's just, I was just making the choices that I, that I needed that were good. Everything in my life, doing the right thing. And I'm like, if I just keep doing the right thing, because I was... I was the guy who cut corners, always cut corners. I was like worm on rounders. I just, I always <laughs> That's such for, a good movie. I was just, I'd always look yeah. for the edge. Yeah. I always looking for the edge. How can I beat the system? How can I, you know, scam? I mean, look at, I didn't go to college in this. I was always looking to beat the system, yeah. not just do the right thing and do. I was always looking for a cheat. And you've seen more financial and business success since you got away with that strategy. A hundred percent. Interesting. Doing the right thing. I'm finally listening to my father after all these years yep. and now it's become beneficial to me. I love you that. Know, because people will cheat and you will get away with it a couple times, but you're going to get burned more times than not. I always say dead bodies float to the surface. The truth always surfaces. That's Let true. me ask you this too. Things are moving in your direction in all ways. Your family, you'll be back on Vanderpump. You got the restaurant. Another thing that we now know, because this, when this podcast was released, it just came out. You got another show coming on. Yeah, so how this came about was a couple of years ago, um, this is kind of when like I was off the show and this is when I'm starting to get the itch. And I'm like, you know what, I miss being on TV. I'm seeing that, you know, COVID was ending, Vanderpump was going back on the air. I'm like, there's something to be told here. Like I, I have a huge fan base. People are still reaching out to me. We want you back, we want you back. I'm like, there's something here. So it was a rainy, cold night, like on a, on a Friday night. And I, I called up my, uh, I texted my old, uh, uh, the, the guy who runs Evolution, yep. Mr. Baskin. I said, hey, listen, I got an idea. Can I meet you? He's like, sure. Yeah, let's meet at a hotel. It's like I said, it was a cold, wintry night it was around this time, a couple of years ago. So I sat down, we sit in the lobby hotel, and I go, I have an idea. I go, I'm ready to come back to TV first. I'm ready to come back. I think there's a place for me. I think that 
I just think that there's something there. And he, and he agreed. He agreed right away. I go, you know, I have a huge fan base that's followed me for the last decade. I got married and I had a kid and no one's seen any of that. And people are saying, what's going on? And people love following me on social media. And I just thought, this is a good time. I think enough time has passed. Yeah. I think wounds have healed. I think we've all grown. We've all learned. We've all taken a piece of like humble pie. And I think I can come back to TV and be a better person than what I was before. And hopefully, you know, make it entertaining as well. Okay. What I was going to say though, usually you're like, you know, you know what your place is on TV. How will this be different? What can we expect with the show? Like, what's um, be about? I mean, obviously that, that villain is, is always still on my <laughs> shoulder. He's always going to okay. be there. You know, I have to work very, very hard in life to keep that guy quiet. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it's always been. It's easier for me to, like I said, cut corners than it is to make the right choices, but I have to work hard on that. And, and I'm, I'm aware of that and I'm okay with that. Um, but I do things a lot different now. I think life changed for me when my son was born. Yeah, it, it changed a lot for me when I got married. But I think the real kicker was is when my son was born. And like now, I cannot f up. Before I was like, oh, I can get away with this. I can get away with this. Now I can't. Yeah. And I, 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 I will never make, you know, any poor decisions again because I have a son. And and I just know one day he's going to look back and he's already going to see a lot of flaws in his father. He's already going to see a ton because of the Internet, because of whatever. He's going to see a lot of flaws, but he's going to see from as soon as he was born on that I was a good person. I love everything about that. It's a testament to your entire story. It's a testament to your career and financial success. And it seems as though as you continue to make these adjustments, you learn faster than the adjustments you have to make. And it has just served you in a huge way. I just have a couple quick rapid fire questions for you. When you look back at 2023, Jax, can you think of one big financial win, one big financial loss when you look at your year? Well, my win is that probably being back on the show. Or, I'm sorry, back to reality TV. It's my uh, big financial win. Okay. Financial uh, my loss. big financial loss. What do you think on that? Maybe. Uh, probably paying back back taxes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. You know? We didn't touch on that. You know that. what's really nice, though, is I'm, I'm finally, after the last two years, just ahead of the game with the IRS. I yeah. got those bastards off my back. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it was grueling because there was some times where, you know, work was tough and times were tough, and I just. You know, I was behind on certain things, but it's finally, I got those assholes off my back. The creditors are <laughs> off your ass. IRS is back yeah. off your ass. No one on your ass anymore. No Jax. one's on my ass anymore. <laughs> and um, yeah, things are, like I said, just making good choices. I, I can't stress enough. Do not try to cheat the systems out yep. here because you it, will will, get it will get caught and it will haunt you. And you might get away with a couple hands. Yep. You might, but in the long run, it will hurt you. I was going to ask you rapid fire the best asset or thing that you ever bought, but I'm going to take a guess at what it is. I heard on another interview uh, when uh, that you had bought your dad a 74 Corvette. And 73. that was one of, 73. And that was one of the most rewarding purchases. Other than my home, you're right. I, I, I thought about that. Yeah, just because, just to see, it was one of those things, like I just wanted to show my dad that I've done it. Yeah. You know, I just want to show my dad, like what can I do? Because he doesn't see, he doesn't come out here. He's yeah. very concerned. He doesn't know what I do. He just assumes that I'm fine. But like, how can I show my dad that like, dad, I, I don't need you. I, I got this. And so I bought my dad uh, his favorite car, the one that he had to give up when he found out that he was going to have me. Oh, so my dad wow. had to sell his 73 Stingray when my mom said she was pregnant. So I found the car, I bought it, and I bought him a golf cart. That's so damn cool. And my parents uh, lived in Florida at the time. My father's no longer with us, but yeah, at the time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well that, I mean, good for you. That's amazing. He's looking down on you and you'll always have his saying tattooed yeah. on your arm. Quick rapid fire, who's better at business, you or Brittany? That's a Ryan question. I'm going to take the fifth on that. Take the fifth on that. I Financially can, or? <laughs> I, I can. All right. We'll take the fifth yeah. on that. Last one I got for you. I know that Brittany's mother is a Bachelor fan. And this is kind of a two-part question. I know that you're the block guy. That's like your merch line. Like you block people. One, what dictates when and if you block someone? And two, this is just fun for my Bachelor audience. Brittany's mother, Bachelor fan favorites, Bachelor villains. Who would you say they are? Let's first start with blocking. Why do you block people? I just, I don't have patience for people who come after me who don't know who I am, who hide behind a keyboard. Keyboard warriors just like to come out and they want to be heard. So I shut them down right at the get-go. Just you have, boom, block. Just boom, block. And again, okay. it's like you have no idea who I am. You're yeah. listening to outsources of little things. People get tidbits off of these, these I don't want to even say A-class social media, uh, A-class um, uh, not even like big 
uh, medias. They're, yeah. they're getting things off of just like the bottom of the barrel medias. Yeah. And they're just putting things together and saying something. You have no idea. They hide behind these eggs or these people with two followers and just to get a little bite. So I just, it pisses me off. I, I just angry injury mad. So I just block right off the bat. I don't even mute. I block. Don't deal um, with trolls. Just mute them. Brittany's mother, bachelor she's fan. She's a huge bachelor village. fan. And I know, I think she's, um, gosh, who is she a fan of? That's, she's really into the voice now. She's Ooh. really big into the, all those singing shows. Okay. She's huge into that. Um, I can't remember the last Bachelor that she watched. Um, I think she she wasn't in. I don't think she was into the one with the uh, the older gentleman. I don't oh, think she okay. got into it. Interesting. All right. But um, I wish I could answer that for you, but All I don't. Right. I don't we'll, know. We'll pass on know. that one. But I know she's a huge fan of it. You're I love right. it. Good. I stuff. can't keep up with with. There's so many. A lot of action. A lot of action. There's a whole lot of us. Let's end with this. We gotta get a trading secret from you, Jax and Ryan. I'm getting one from you. It is a lesson that people can't learn from a professor, a classroom, a TikTok tutorial. They can only learn from your business, financial, and career success. So one trading secret, Jax, what can you leave us I with? just do, do your research. Do your homework. Um, talk to people. Find out what your niche is. You know, Figure out what, your, what the world needs. Don't just do something just to do it. Do something you enjoy. Do something you love. Because at the end of the day, you'll never work a day in your life if you do what you love. But definitely do your research, especially if you're kind of move out here. You're going to move to California. You're like, I got this idea. Save your money. Save, save, save. Um, and be careful who you trust out here. It's mm -hmm. it's worse now than even when I got here. Everybody's out to get you out here. Everybody. Mm -hmm. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. And then when you do get to that point, they want you even more. So just be careful who you trust. Keep a good, solid uh, friend group. You know, keep your enemies close. You know, and they, they, what they say, what is the saying? Keep your friends, close, friends and your close, your enemies close. That's a hundred percent true. Okay. Because like like I said, so just. Uh, like I said, just do your homework and just be passionate about what you do and don't listen to other people. Stay off. So I, I stay off social media. I, I just started this, this year. I stay off all that said. Everybody's muted. I only follow a couple things that I enjoy personally, yep. but I don't read comments anymore. I don't read any of that because it's all bullshit. Yeah, I like that. And then you'll edit yourself to be something you're not. I love that. Ryan, exactly. trading secret, what could he leave us with? I'm going to say no matter what position you are in the entertainment industry, whether it's a actor, reality star, writer, producer, Ellen representative, you have to have patience. It's mm. going to take time. There's really rarely overnight successes. Yeah, that's a big one. He's yeah. telling he tells me this all the time. Like yeah. when I started the new show, when I pitched this new show, yeah, he's like, it's going to take time. You need patience. And yep. patience. I can't tell you how many times in the last two years I call him stressed out. What am I going to do? What am mm -hmm. I going to do? He's, first thing he does say patience, 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 patience. And he's right. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It does not. I love it. Trading secrets. I'm taking away here. Patience. I think, uh, Jax, for you, perseverance. I think not cutting corners, keeping your guard up. And when people are at their lowest lows, like kind of live in it and know that it's going to be a trajectory for what's going And you forward. never know what people are going through, man. You yeah. never know who you're going to run into in this town. You never know. So just, you know, be a good person. I be nice it. to people. You know, you'll feel better about yourself. I used to be such an asshole to people. I was selfish. I didn't give a shit about anybody. Yep. But now, you just, just be nice to everybody. You never know who you're going to run into, and you never know what someone else is going through, especially out here. It's yeah. tough out here. Small town, too. Yeah. If you're, like, no one wants to work with an asshole. Yeah. You can get away with it for a little while, but, you know, people talk, and if you're an asshole and you're mean to people, you can get pretty blacklisted. And even L.A. has made Jax Taller say, Go be the nice guy. Be the nice guy. Be <laughs> I nice. love it. Have a little grit, have but a be little a nice grit, guy. But be a nice guy and still be yourself. All right, Jax, where can everyone find everything you have going on? Well, I'm on Instagram, at Mr. Jax Taylor. Uh, come and check out my bar. Jax is in Studio City. It's officially open. You can add it to your Vander Crawl. I like to say the Vander Crawl. Let's go. You can go, uh, you can go to Tom's Place, and you can go to Lisa's, and then you save the best for last. You go to my bar. Uh, we got a children's book coming out. We got a great podcast, When Reality Hits with Jax and Brittany, out every week. It's doing very well. We have a lot of fun there. And uh, yeah, a couple other projects in the works too. But yeah, that's about it for now. Absolutely killing it. From rock bottom, almost heading back to Michigan to now absolutely destroying it. Ryan, where can people find you if they have any questions about the industry you want to reach out? I'm private, but I am at Revel9, R E V E L 9. Ryan Ravel. Guys, go check him out. Jax, thank you so much for being here. And Thanks honestly, I think your story of restarts, resurrection uh, to where you are today, happily married with a kid and on your way to achieve things you never have, it's fucking awesome. So you're an inspiration and thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me.